The Connection Show, inspiring hope, health, and healing, sponsored by Braveheart Workshops live with Jill Reynolds. And joining me in San Marcos, California at the General Flynn Reawaken Conference with Clay Clark is Errol Weber from Costa Mesa, Costa Mesa, mm -hmm. California. So welcome to the show, Errol. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Thanks for having me. Well, Errol, on this show, we do things a little bit different from some of the other podcasters here at the event. One of the things that we love to do is we love to share with the audience about your life, connecting the dots of when you were born, Errol, the good, the bad, and the ugly, and share with us how your life has transformed from a little boy and things you went through in your life and how that led to you, led you to who you are today. So if you're willing, Errol, would you be willing to share a little bit about yourself growing up? Okay. So how far back do you want me to go? You want me to go back to the part where I'm running around the yard in Jamaica climbing mango trees and sitting on the branches and eating you, mangoes at you, five, you, six years old? You can go there <laughs> right, or, or you can go right to the womb, whatever memory uh, you have. Oh, I can't go back that far. But <laughs> um, so I grew up in Jamaica. My entire family uh, grew up in Jamaica. And my family and I, we came to the U.S. in 2002. And I want to share a quick story about how we even got here. So in Jamaica, it's uh, like any other country. A lot of the country is absolutely great. But then there are those uh, parts that are slightly dangerous. So I lived in a neighborhood in Jamaica called Vineyard Town. It sounds lovely and bucolic, like Coral Gables or Napa yeah. Valley. No, uh, Vineyard Town was anything but that. Mm -hmm. um, I grew up in an area that was considered the demarcation line between the two major political parties. You had the Liberal People's National Party on one side, and you had the very conservative Jamaica Labour Party on the other side. And whenever there's an upheaval, there will always be uh, gunfire happening on our street in Jamaica. Very, very similar to the drive-by shootings in Chicago. Even worse. Okay. Even worse. Because it was sustained. Like... Uh, almost a soundtrack. You know like how some people, they'll go to sleep to the sound of waterfalls and whatnot? We had to go to sleep to the sound of persistent gunfire mm -hmm. on an almost daily basis. Mm -hmm. And the final straw for us was back in the summer of 2001 when they were trying to break up an upheaval and a tank rolled down our street and fired nine rockets in the air and one of those rockets went hurtling through the mango tree in our front yard, went through the, my mom's bedroom window and blew up in our house. So it wasn't when you were, tr you were climbing the mango tree? <laughs> no. Uh, so we had a yard where we had 46 trees. There were nine mango trees in the yard. I just wasn't in that one. Mm. Um, <laughs> Praise God. Yeah. And it, that explosion in our house made the house pretty much uninhabitable. And then in the months following, my mom got a dream from God, and uh, it involved going to the U.S. Embassy and working to get permanent residency visas to come and live in the U.S. And was your father in the picture? Of course. Okay. So both my parents are, uh, they, they both have doctorate's degrees in Christian marriage counseling. They've been married for, well, almost 40 years now. Mm -hmm. I'm very happy about them, uh, very grateful to have them. They're incredible parents. And uh, both my parents are church ministers. So one day, um, so in our family, my, we have this thing where for a moment, we could be the only one who could smell this very distinct rose fragrance. And my mom, this happened right after my mom got a dream. And one day we smelled this rose fragrance and uh, we got the inspiration to go take a different route on our route home from church instead of just going straight home. We went to our aunt's house and a couple minutes in we turned on the TV to find out that there was a shootout that had broken out right, pretty much right in front of our house. And had we continued down the street from church uh, at home at night, we would have driven right into the shootout. And it's this kind of guidance from God that we took all throughout our lives. And one of the biggest pieces of guidance was when my mom got 
a dream at four in the morning and woke up my dad and they went to the U.S. Embassy to go and uh, get permanent residency visas for us to live in the, for us all to live in the U.S. How long did that take? So for context, it usually takes years for this process to happen. My aunt, uh, who's, uh, she applied in 1999 and she's still in Jamaica today. Um, my parents, we, they went to, they woke up at four in the morning, went to the U.S. Embassy and camped out in front of the embassy. And then at 10 o'clock in the morning, they called and said, hey, put on some clothes, we're coming to pick you up because they want to take your picture. So six hours. So it got approved in six hours? In six hours. And so we went from, we the needed a visa day, were to... You, were you gone? So we started selling and getting rid of everything. We had to get rid of... So the property that we had in Jamaica was a house, a river, part of a mountain, a waterfall, lots of, uh, lots of property. And we barely sold anything. We just gave it away to family members. And wow. we packed 27 suitcases and came to America in August. Because you knew your so safety was more imminent than property. Exactly. Um, so we got five permanent residency visas and while they were still like processing of getting it into our passports, we were making all of these moves to uh, get rid of all of our stuff. We ended up packing 27 suitcases and came to the U.S. in August of 2002. So besides, and I'm not, I'm I'm not going to say besides because that sounds like it was not that important, with the grace of God being on your side, was there anything else you can share with us that you know led to you guys getting it that quickly? Besides God, because I know it was only God, but besides God, because that's like the most important, what made them jump the hoops to say yes to you? There are a couple other factors. So in, in so Jamaica is a British Commonwealth country, and every British Commonwealth country has a representative to the Queen called the Governor General. So um, in Jamaica, the governor general at the time, whenever he was not available to do his duties, it was the duty of the pastor of our church in Kingston. And when she wasn't available to do it, it was my dad's job. So we grew up in the public eye all the time. We had to be on our P's and Q's all the time. There was no room for acting out ever as a kid. It's just you're either on your best behavior or you're on your best behavior. That's about it. And um, so there is a somewhat government connection of being a respected figure in, in the Jamaican community. And then there is also, when it comes to getting permanent residency visas, uh, the United States prioritizes complete families as opposed to singular people. So, so a, lot, a lot of your connections then with your father being like almost like the second person that in they line, yeah. in line uh-huh. <laughs> he he had a little bit of clout a little clout <laughs> just a hair <laughs> just a little just bit. a hair because <laughs> i'm like all right i know that was god orchestrated but something else helped helped you out there you know everything every little bit of it helped and yeah. we're grateful that it happened at the time uh because a lot of very terrible things happened in jamaica uh so much so i even made my college senior thesis about an experience that happened in Jamaica where a police officer was killed in his police car and his car was set on fire in front of our house. Um, there are a lot of traumatic situations yeah. happen when I'm in my early teens in Jamaica. Wow. Um, so with yeah. that, with that, Errol, like, again, you said, you know, living in a home that you had to have your P's and Q's lined up. Mm-hmm. Okay. When you finally got to an age where you weren't under the jurisdiction of mom and dad in 18, whenever it was you left home and mm-hmm. maybe went off to school. Did you ever let your wild oats out and say, dad and mom aren't watching me, now, I, a, now it, I can break free? It's a good question. So I went to college at the Maryland Institute College of Art. I was living in Baltimore, my entire family was living in Baltimore at the time. And it was like a 30 minute commute from or 30 minutes to an hour commute from my home in Baltimore to the school, the Maryland Institute College of Art. And I did that for the first few months of college. But it was eating away at my social life, it was eating away at the amount of time I had to do other work. So I asked my dad, hey, can I uh, go move on campus? Well, when I moved on campus, that ATM called Dad disappears. So in, uh, what was it, like three months into college, I had taken enough classes in video production class and electronic media class to start 
taking what I learned in those classes and offering it as a service. So I started my first business out of my college dorm room. Wow. I call it EJ Photo Video, Errol Jr. Photo Video, because my dad's Errol Sr. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was doing, and if you remember, November is right before December, and you have all of these parents who have kids who are in choirs that need to do Christmas programs. Well, every kid, their parents want a little $30 DVD of that performance. So while everybody else was eating cup ramen noodles in college, I was actually eating pretty decently because <laughs> like I, I, I had a job. I made, a, I made opportunity for myself and others and started a video production company in my dorm room. So you didn't need dad's ATM. So I did not need the ATM called dad. But what it taught you then was then how to be self-sufficient. Correct. And I bet you learned how to save money too. I did. I also almost immediately invested a lot more money into, uh, into future projects, such as uh, right after the first year of college, I got connected with a wedding photographer. And a lot of people, when they hire wedding photographers, they usually hire as a package photography and video. Well, he needed a guy to do video. So I got, I got training as an apprentice to be a wedding videographer. And to date, I've done about 86 wedding videos uh, between 2005 and 2010. Wow. And yeah, it's a lot of wedding cake. So it, sounds, <laughs> it, so, it, so it sounds to me like even though you were finally set free from minding your own P's and Q's, in having the freedom to be on your own, you really didn't have a lot of time to get in trouble. No, I didn't because my work day was, so I got, like, in addition to weddings, there was always Tuesday and Friday night service at church where I was a broadcast cameraman and Sunday morning where I was a broadcast cameraman. And I'd go to class from 9 to 3 or 4 to 10 p.m., depending on which class it was uh, in art school, whether it's a drawing class or a painting class or a video class or whatnot. But in the evening time, I would then go and shoot like charity galas and fashion shows and all these events that happened wow. at night. So I didn't really get much time to sleep. So it's either working on art projects in the daytime or doing event photography and video in the nighttime. And that was, that was my four years. So I'm going to take you on another mm -hmm. challenging question. No problem. Okay. Because you had so much activity going on with the busy schedule, mm -hmm. okay, did you ever have time for stillness to be able to sit quietly and process the trauma of your childhood? I processed it very early on, and this sounds very, I, I don't know the right word for this, but the trauma that happened in Jamaica, it got rolled into many other prior experiences that I had, and it almost became like conditioning. It's a very terrible thing that happens uh, to people who live in an environment that's dangerous. Mm -hmm. But if you imagine the type of people who live in Chicago or Baltimore or Minneapolis, and they have to see um, people getting injured or dying on a very regular basis, the first few times it happens, it, it hits you really hard. But after a while, you begin to learn how to cope with yeah. it. I, uh, I, I know what you're saying because mm -hmm. I remember hearing um, years ago with uh, James Dobson, mm -hmm. uh, Dr. James Dobson, yep. shared, and it was very profound. I remember hearing he said that he did an experiment with children where, um, it, it, when I say children, I'm talking like high school to college, mm -hmm. where uh, they were raised in a very um, conservative Christian home. And they never watched any kind of movies except G-rated. Mm -hmm. And then they watched an R-rated or, or even a PG-rated mm -hmm. horror film, like a very light horror film. Mm -hmm. And they watched the first horror film they've ever seen, and they were petrified. And then the next one had even more horror, and they were less horror, you know, terrified. Mm -hmm. By the time they got to the fifth one, which was the most grueling it didn't even phase them because they had gotten conditioned with mm -hmm. terror that the worst terror was like the sixth film. Mm -hmm. And that was less terror to them than the first one. And it is, it's like a conditioning with the psyche that gets used to the trauma and the mm -hmm. terror that you just, you don't even know you're in terror. 
-hmm. Is that kind of what you're saying? In certain ways, you don't even know because your life has lived so much of it. It's just part of life. So you definitely know that there are instances that people would consider traumatic happening at the time. Um, there are some traumatic stories that they're probably like they are necessary to a story like this, but it's just not appropriate for, mm -hmm. for, for the, this yeah. broadcast. But mm -hmm. um, you experience it and you go through your grieving process and it's usually a couple days. Mm -hmm. um, and what it does is that it contributes toward you learning how to mitigate future risk. Mm -hmm. So I don't go about my life in a constant state of fear. Mm -hmm. I go about, I believe it's important for everyone to be situationally aware and also to have a daily effort to mitigate risk of harm to oneself. Mm -hmm. I believe that it's important to do that and it's sometimes very simple things mm -hmm. like making sure that somebody in your family has access to your phone's login so that they can track down where your phone is so they can possibly find you. If something were to um, happen. Exactly. Things like not walking down a dark alley at 2 in the morning. Yeah. Having discernment and wisdom. Yeah. Just so, so very with, basic thing. So with you moving to the United States mm -hmm. when you were blessed, um, at what age then did you become a, a U.S. citizen? So I came to the U.S. in 2002 when I was 15 years old. And then I became a U.S. citizen. I burned through all 10 years of my green card and became a U.S. citizen in 2012. In 2012. Uh-huh. And now that you become a United States citizen, mm -hmm. where is God leading you to do career-wise now? Where is God directing your path? Good question. I spent my time in college uh, in Maryland studying film. And right after I finished college in May of 2008, I went to Zimbabwe to shoot a documentary about musicians with disabilities in Bulawayo. And that was the first foray into going out, checking out the world, of spending nine months filming in the jungles of Africa, lots of fun, and seeing firsthand what happens when government officials who are drunk on power forsaking their own people. Centralizing government, centralizing power, centralizing wealth, centralizing the, re the means of production, and intimidating voters, silencing opposition, all of these real-world examples of what happens to failed states. Then, finishing that documentary uh, in 2009, it ended up winning the Oscar for Best Documentary Short in 2010. After that, did a documentary about HIV awareness in Lusaka, Zambia, a documentary about cervical cancer and women's health in Liberia, a documentary about access to health care in rural America, a documentary about public versus private education, and we filmed that one in New York. We did a short film about bullying, we did a documentary about uh, the school to prison pipeline and what it takes to engage children in after school programs so that they don't go down the path of getting into crime. Um, did a documentary about labor movements, did a faith based documentary, a pro law enforcement, pro community documentary about improving police community relations. And after all these hundreds of film screenings and workshops and town halls and conferences, what do you do with all that knowledge? Do you just sit on it? Or do you turn it into policy that can better the lives of people? So after you turn it into policy, you turn it into solutions, do you shop it around to your garden variety uh, uh, conservative or liberal politician to, see, to hopefully see what can be done about implementing these solutions? Or do you run for office yourself? <laughs> and I looked up the qualifications. It was in 2018, I was, December 2018, I was visiting my family and I was having a moment where I had just finished working and touring on the most recent documentary I did at the time about police community relations. And I'm like, what is my next move? What's my next move? And I was like, let us explore the idea of running for public office. Now, which issues are important to me? Because that's going to determine which office I run for. If I run for Congress, it's federal level issues, national security, things like that. If it's a state level issue or local uh, level issue, then you may want to run for the state assembly, state senate, or uh, for a city council race if you really want to go local. Mm -hmm. I had policy solutions for things that were local, state, and, and federal. So things like how to solve the traffic problem in California without spending billions of dollars on additional <laughs> infrastructure, which is not the solution. 
So that was one of the first ideas I came up with, and that's a one-hour uh, discussion, discussion to, uh, to delve into that. Then there's the, how do we solve the homeless situation in California? That's another one that I developed a state-level and collaborative federal-level solution to. And then I'm an immigrant from Jamaica who came to the U.S. the right way. And I believe that America is better when people from all over the world, they bring their drive and their energy, their motivation, their ideas, their ingenuity, uh, and their desire to make America even better than when they arrived. All I ask is that they come to America through the appropriate legal channels. Amen. That's it. Yep. That's it. Come yep. to America, make America even better than when you arrive. But do it legally. But do it legally. Go through the system, That's be it. it legally. And, be, and, and you know, I'm going to expound on that, Errol, mm-hmm. because one of the reasons I feel it's so imperative, imperative to do it legally, mm-hmm. is because those who are choosing to do it legally... It's so unfair to them Mm -hmm. who are paying top dollars for immigration attorneys Mm -hmm. and the time frame, what they have to go through, the grueling time frame to become a citizen, Mm -hmm. because it's grueling. Yes. It's grueling. I think it's so unfair for someone who's going through it legally to be pushed aside for the illegals coming in Mm -hmm. who are being given money and House services, every, schooling, service, everything they're being given to for the f- tune of roughly three thousand three hundred dollars per head per month. Correct, and yet the other people who have come legally on work permits mm-hmm. are sitting back. I have a, a personal friend of mine who was a client of mine in Chicago, mm-hmm. who came to the United States on a work permit about seven months before nine eleven. Mm-hmm. Him and his wife and two children. When they got to the United States, she, his wife got pregnant with their third child. So his third child was born a United States citizen. Do you know, and I haven't talked to him now in about three and a half years, but three and a half years ago, okay, so 9-11 to three and a half years ago, tens of thousands of dollars in immigration attorneys, he still had not yet become a citizen. Mm-hmm. And he had been waiting in line because they only give a certain amount of citizenship to Canadian citizens per year. And so his children grew up, all went through high school and off to college, and that one of his children were able to get a work permit because they weren't citizens yet. So, And his wife couldn't go back to work and get a work permit. So the man was at, at the mercy of earning enough money on his own to send his three children to college. And this man has worked in the United States since Mm 9-11, and he has not accrued, he has not been able, he doesn't qualify to get his um, Social Security when he retires. And yet he's been here all these years. This is a broken system. It is a broken system. Um, he would have actually been better off, and I do not recommend this. He would, have better, he, he would have been better off taking a flight to Mexico and crossing the border by foot and saying, Sin papeles. I'm here. Yeah, I'm here. Uh-huh. Yeah, can I have all the benefits that everyone else has? Mm-hmm. And it's so sad because I am so much the same as you. Because I know this man and I know his story, I have more of a passion for what you believe too because mm-hmm. it's like, it's not fair. It's just not fair. Mm-hmm. He's, and his family's lovely, and he's a lovely man. Mm-hmm. And this is guy, this guy's a chief information officer. I mean, he's not I mean, not to put anyone down. I mean, he's not like uh, you know uh, picking up trash in in you know with the homeless people. This guy is a chief information officer, and his company has given money for his immigration, and he still can't get in. That's just absolutely incredible, isn't it? Mm-hmm. So let's go back. I sorry, I sidetracked. No but when you said that, it was like, oh my yep. gosh. And and that is why I, when I was deciding what to run for, I thought that immigration, among other things, was one of the most important federal level issues that we need to tackle. I also mention in many speeches that in this country, a failure to address key federal issues has a negative rippling effect on state level issues when it comes to quality of life. So when we complain about a ballooning homeless problem, irrespective of how much money you throw at the problem, when we complain about a mental health and a drug abuse problem, we have to ask ourselves, 
what is happening on the federal level that is enabling this to get worse? And when you have poor border policy, federal, you end up having 1,954 miles of southern border that needs to be protected. And our resources are stretched thin because anyone can cross the border at almost any point on the border. And so much fentanyl can come in. Exactly. And kill our kids. I believe it was in 2019 that uh, Tom Homan, the former ICE director, he was giving a press conference and he mentioned that uh, to date, and it was like eight months into the year, to date, uh, enough fentanyl, fentanyl had entered the United States and been intercepted by ICE and intercepted by DEA to kill every man, woman, and child in the U.S. three times. Yep. So imagine roughly uh, enough fentanyl to kill every American four times is being intercepted every year. Not to mention how many terrorists have come across the board and ready to kill yes. us all. <laughs> Well, <laughs> not to be mm-hmm. not to be a, a homewrecker, but I just can't even imagine how many are infiltrated into uh, our exactly. country. Exactly, or deliberately shipped in every time that Joe Biden puts another country in crisis, like Afghanistan and shipping in sixty thousand yeah. Afghan bring, refugees. Let's bring who in immediately another. started raping people the nanosecond they touched down. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's craziness. Crazy, crazy, crazy. So anyway, so you are running then for Congress. I I'm see. running for Congress Okay. because federal level issues, even though I have state and local level things that are important to me, I'm running for federal level issues. One of them is important, which is election integrity. It's a state level issue and the federal government should not be involved in in the state level issue of elections, but we do have a role in holding states accountable for making sure that their elections remain honest. So you know what other issue, and I know we have to do a hard break here, that you know what other issue that I really wish everyone would address this year? Okay, so I think immigration absolutely mm-hmm. has to be, absolutely 110%. But the one that I really have a passion for is school vouchers. I really believe we must give parents the right to choose the school of their choice oh for their gosh. children because I was a Were sing- you reading my brochure? No, I was, I was, Errol, a single, never married mom for 17 years. And I sent my son to Christian school mm-hmm. back, and my son's now 39, so you've got, you're going back 30 some years. Mm-hmm. And it cost me $2,000 per month to send my son to Christian education. And yet my tax dollars paid for the public schools. Right. And I was a single mom making, you know, and I did fairly well. I was making between seventy to eighty-five thousand dollars a year with which, no. Which adjusted for inflation is a bunch. Yeah, and mm-hmm. with, yeah, and but when you're saying that I'm paying that out, coming up with two thousand a month to pay for his education. That's be, a third of your, yeah, a third yeah. of your pay. And then paying my taxes back to the public schools That's that I wasn't using. A quarter of your pay. Right, right. There's something wrong here. Mm-hmm. And when the school systems are perverting our children with all kinds of crazy, insane propaganda, pornography, and everything mm-hmm. else they're feeding our kids. And, we, and we're not even given the right to stop it because they won't let us yet, right? Mm-hmm. They're just doing whatever they want. Mm-hmm. Um, I want to be able to say, I'm pulling my kid out of this school that's unionized, and I want to put my child wherever I choose. It's my child. Mm-hmm. And I want my government money to go to my kid's school where I choose. Mm -hmm. So that is one, without a doubt. So my my feelings are, and I don't really go heavily into, I hardly ever talk politics on my show, believe it or not. I stay God-centered in story. But my three things are immigration, school vouchers, Mm -hmm. and term limits. No one should be in office except for, in my opinion, in my opinion, one term. Six years, boom, you're in as a business person. Like our, our founding fathers came in as businessmen and women. And then they did, they served their time in office and they went back to their careers. And we, we, we got to change this. There are no more career politicians. Well, there are a couple things to factor in that, um, because I've heard both sides of the argument when it comes to term limits. Uh, There's a section of the Constitution that talks about uh, the pay for members of Congress uh, in the House and the Senate, how the pay can never decrease. But there's also another section in the Constitution that talks about after five years of being in office, you're eligible for a pension. So um, I know you don't like getting political on your show, 
But um, what is her name? AOC is on her fourth mm -hmm. year in Congress. Mm -hmm. So if she isn't removed from Congress by the fifth year, so by the end of this election we're paying, cycle, we're paying for her for the life. We're paying her for life. For life. For life. For what? For what is a she pension done? on a one seventy four thousand a year job? Mm -hmm. Exactly for life. But I, I also believe though, you know, what, one of the reasons I think term limits are so important, in my opinion, and in the first year, some it's, it's like going back to starting up a brand new job. When you're going into a brand new job, it's going to take you three to six months to know what you're doing. So you have a politician going into office for their first time, you know, a freshman mm -hmm. politician. Three to six months it's going to take them to acumen into their position right. and really understand the way it works, mm -hmm. okay? So now you're, you're you know, you've got uh, four years, you've got six months wasted by them trying to figure out what to do. Mm -hmm. And then a year and a half before they're out of office, they're campaigning again. Mm -hmm. And so they're really only working for a year and a half. <laughs> That's the way I look at it. Mm -hmm. You're working for a year and a half for a four-year paycheck. And so for me, I think that's just insanity. So for me, I just think if we just changed it to one term, if you want to call it a four-year term, a five-year term, a six-year, and then you're done. No more campaigning. Go on and go back to what you were doing before. Figure out what you want to do for the rest of your life. But... I just think it's so important to do that because we're wasting so much taxpayer dollars and wasting other people's money that could be used for good causes for campaigning. Mm -hmm. I mean, campaigning is great for one election and then move on. But that's my that's mm -hmm. my that's all I want to say in my bandwagon. So, another issue, and I'm going to go back to this school choice initiative that you are pushing as well. Uh, in California, there's an organization called CaliforniaSchoolChoice.org, and one of the things that they're pushing, it's actually not a voucher program, but it's a personalized bank account unique to that child. So uh, each year, the state of California dedicates roughly $14,000 per child for education. Well, what CaliforniaSchoolChoice.org is pushing is a personal bank account for that child that's essentially open the moment that they're born. And those $14,000 per year, it goes into their personal account that the parent can then choose where to send uh, their child to school. And the tax, then their ch tax dollars that go into the money that go into that bank account go toward the school of, that ch of their choice. So now you aren't having uh, unions having giant control over all the public schools. And what happens is when teachers feel protected that they can never lose their job, irrespective of how well they perform, performance begins to uh, suffer. Yep. And because of that, many children are stuck in failing schools. Mm -hmm. Last election cycle, I ran in California's 37th congressional district in Los Angeles. The 37th district is right in the middle of LA. And it had, what was it, a 78% high school graduation rate, a 35% college graduation rate in a community that had a 46,000 a year median income. Meaning half the people made less than 46,000 a year. So they were growing up in uh, lesser income communities that were economically held back, but I won't go into the details of how that happened on this show unless you want me to. And well, what I found interesting is, mm -hmm. I think it was, I'm almost positive it was Baltimore, but I could be wrong. When I heard the statistics that came out, that said that high school students mm -hmm. were um, um, coming in with with their uh, the I don't know the ratings or their they were reading at kindergarten level mm -hmm. in high school. Yep, kindergarten level. Mm -hmm. And if we don't think we're failing our children, it, something is wrong. But I'm going to let. Era for you to tell the audience how they can connect with you. Do you have a website yes. or how do they connect to you? So we have a lot of work doing as we head into the June 7 primary election. We have to get our word out, boots on the ground, getting people walking door to door and making phone calls on behalf of our campaign. You can learn how you can get involved and get in touch with us at WeberForAmerica.com. You can spell it with one B or two Bs. My name has two Bs in it, but even if you misspell it, you're still going to go to the site. It's WeberForAmerica.com. Awesome. 
So everyone, so let's support Errol. He sounds like an amazing person of God and can make a difference in California. We really need to make a difference in California. We need to keep California as part of our 50 states. Yes. <laughs> we don't need to knock you off the face of the earth. <laughs> oh my gosh. California needs a lot of work, but it is not a lost cause. Absolutely. We just have to all get involved. Yep. We cannot become uh, we, we cannot become dismayed and think that uh, it's all over for California. It's not. Yep. We cannot just all run away and if you have the ability to stay, stay and fight. This mm -hmm. state is worth keeping. Yes. Well, God bless you. Thanks so much, Yero. Thank you so much. Bye-bye,